if you don't if you didn't know him already and if you do know him you just need to reconnect with him because he certainly speaks to this time that we find ourselves in when everything is upside down and inside out and thurman more than anybody probably was able to stay connected to himself and his own call in the midst of people calling him to be who they wanted him to be he mm -hmm. he lived his life never never joining a civil rights march never protesting but yet having one of the most profound voices to help that whole struggle and dr king is reported to have carried his book jesus and the disinherited in his briefcase all of the time and people are still doing that carrying jesus and the disinherited almost as if it's a an addition additional book in the bible or something because it has that kind of impact and meaning and one young man who was an activist said of howard thurman though thurman never has gone out to participate in a march he helps all of us to understand why we're going mm -hmm. and i think that 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 is such a, a amazingly wonderful compliment for somebody to get first of all and second of all for to to see a person have the capacity to really understand what his calling is and not let people get him off that track even though you have to know that the the the, the lament was at one time they thought they had the young people thought they had found moses when they found thurman and thurman turned out to be a mystic and it was just such a disappointment because they were looking for this revolutionary you know and it reminds me that people thought that that's what they thought jesus was going to do too you know jesus was going to be a new king and um and that didn't turn out to be the case and so in some ways i think that that um thurman is a is just a such a profound um um witness to how important it is to actually be clear about where you're called to go and then to stay on that path with absolute steadfastness because he did that his book with head and heart is his biography and if you just want to have a fun read and a pretty fast read to learn about some more about him mm -hmm. you might want to read that and then jesus and the disinherited is an amazingly um powerful book about what jesus has to say to the people with their backs against the wall if you have not read that book it would be good for for you to read it it would be good to study it with some people it would be good to try to internalize it and i want to warn you if you haven't read it you need to read it two or three times because it's that kind of book mm -hmm. so that's just a one um one of the frames that i want our conversation tonight to be underneath the other one is of uh, i did say to that i wanted you to think about um where do you need to start with racial healing work in terms of yourselves in terms of your own journeys and to be kind of pondering that uh you probably have been thinking about it but in light of these conversations that we're having with each other how much deeper do you want to get into that question and in, into that interrogation of yourselves and and then what what bubbled up for you over this past week after having had the conversation we had last week so if you just kind of keep those things in the back of your minds i i want to spend the first um bit of time together talking about um an idea and telling you a little story and then we will at the end we'll spend some time addressing those questions i thought we might start with them but now it feels to me like i need to reverse the order so i'm going to reverse the order and i'm going to tell you this story it's called the rainmaker ideal and it's a story about a little village that um had experienced drought for a very very long time and they decided that they needed to go they were just gonna they were trying to wait for the rain to come and the rains just wouldn't so they decided they needed to go hire the rainmaker to come and be in their village and to help them so they go and they get the person and the person comes and they have a little dwelling for the rainmaker so he goes into his little place where he's gonna stay and the first day they're kind of patient because it's his first day so they're waiting for him to do whatever it is he does and nothing happened and then so they thought okay that was the first day the second day 
they waited thinking the rain's going to start and there's still no rain. So now they're starting to get just a little bit uh, antsy because it's two days now the rainmaker has been in their village and still no rain. And so then on the third day, there's still no rain and they were just about to start having a little bit of a fit. And so they decide to go to, to, uh, to talk to the rainmaker and find out just exactly what the intentions were because now here three days later they, he's been in their village and nothing's happened and as they were gathering themselves up to go and just on the way to his his little place it just started pouring down rain and the rainmaker came out and they said they asked him what what took you so long? What was wrong? Why why have you been here these many days and and it didn't rain? And the rainmaker just looked at them and said, "Well, I had to get my own self in the right place before the rains could come." So, as we as we as we work to figure out what we need to do, anytime I think that's part of the challenge is what do I need to do to get myself in the right place? How do I need to um, understand what my call is? What, what I'm experiencing right now as a person who's been doing this work for the church now for close to 10 years and close to 50 years for my life, but close to 10 years for the Episcopal Church, is that there are a lot of white people who have just kind of gone off the rails with what do I do? What do I need to do? Where can I find the answer? Which book should I read? What should I be thinking? What questions should I be asking? And I just want to keep on saying, just calm down. That's the first thing you need to do. Because in the midst of flailing, you don't find out any answers. You just get more frustrated. You know, like it's like take a deep breath and sit with yourself. Because it's going to be so important for us in six months, in nine months, in 12 months, in 15 months to be doing the right thing. The right thing for us, not the right thing for somebody in the UK or in Venezuela, but for us. And you don't know what that is if you haven't listened to find out because nobody can tell you. So as you think about your way forward with this work, I want you to think about this Rainmaker story and getting your own selves in the right place. And that's one piece. And I want you to remember what you saw with Howard Thurman and how Thurman approaches life and listens and responds to what he calls the sound of the genuine, which is discovering what's at your core and being grounded in that space so that you're not being uh, blown around like like a willow tree in a windstorm because when you don't have that kind of connection to your core you that's what happens why I talk about this kind of stuff when we're talking about race because at the very core racial healing is about people getting well getting well themselves. It's about individual people getting well. And part of getting well is to let go of any kinds of projections that we have uh, in terms of making somebody other. The more we other people, the more we project onto people, the more we ex put our lives out there somewhere, the more we explain ourselves by what's external to us, to that extent, we are not as well as we could be if we were able to take responsibility for how we are seeing the world and for how we're behaving. And we live in a, in a world where there is just so much um, uh, temptation to always know that somebody else is responsible for whatever is wrong. You know, somebody out there is supposed to fix this whatever rather than and what am I supposed to do about this? How does this, it's sitting in front of my face. Why is it in front of my face? Maybe it means I need to do something and, it, and maybe not, but I do need to interrogate that before I decide. So what I, what I wanna talk about for a bit is the question 
that I wanna ask is how conscious are you and how connected are you to your inner community? You know, that community of that, that, that whimpers and hollers and, and works on getting your attention, that community of contrary, of um, competing uh, emotions and uh, intentions and all those things. And if you can think about this, you know, it can be a little bit fun to just think about having a whole lot of little people running around inside of you. And who are those little people? You know, I have this little girl that, that uh, I have a picture of her myself when I was five and she's still running around inside of my psyche thinking that, that maybe I got it all wrong and she needs to look out for me and she better uh, take care of me because I'm going to make a mess. So, she'll, so she will sabotage things before, before I have a chance for the mess to be made. Well, I need her to understand that I'm really, I know more than she does and that I'm, I'm a good mother and I'm not gonna let her go off the rails. But you know, if I don't take care of her, she will disrupt me and, and sabotage me. So who are, who are those little folks running inside, running around inside of your psyche that's coming up with contrary notions and sometimes some really good stuff, some really great stuff, some really wonderful stuff, and then some stuff that you just sometimes can hardly believe that you actually, that it belongs to you. Who is in your inner community? Who is there? And what are they doing? We don't talk enough in the church of, of any kind about this kind of thing. And we're always just kind of explaining to people how they're supposed to be, but we don't tell people what the mitigating factors are that keep them from being able to be who they're supposed to be. It's like we tell people to love each other. We just love, love your neighbor like yourself. Love God, love your neighbor like yourself. And you got all these little disparate community members that's making it real hard for you to love yourself. You know, the, all the little revolutions going on inside your own psyche and you can't get at peace with that. It's difficult then to project peacefulness and loving accepting, acceptance out into the world because you've got this little whole community that's gone haywire. The, 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 the fear, you know, there's a, there's a lovely old book, I'm sure it's out of print now, called Hind Feet, Hind's Feet on High Places. I don't know if you've ever heard of Hannah Hernard, but it's a fantastic book. If you could ever find it, do find it and read it. But it is all about inner community and all the fears and, you know, the, they, she names all of these like foreboding fear and those kinds of characters. It's an allegory. It's an allegory about the journey. And the whole idea is to get hinds feet, to learn how to be agile and, and not be bound by all these forces that are hanging on to you. So why am I talking about this when you are interested in doing work on race? Because I think that we've gone out into the world with some premises about how things are constructed, what reality really is, and we, and we are intending to make things better without understanding there's some, there's some dynamics that if they don't get named and acknowledged and attended to, they'll keep on undermining us. So there's, I, I spent a lot of my life studying the psychology of Carl Jung, and Jung talks a lot about um, the shadow and the shadow, and, you know, I, I know every time I do this talk, Jung turns over in his grave because I, I talk about this in these little uh, snippets of 30, 40 minutes and he spent 30 years figuring it all out. But so I have to always apologize to him for making this into a, a short shrift, but thank God he figured it out. So I don't have to. And all I have to do is tell you what he said. And that takes a lot less time than it did to figure it out. The shadow, the shadow uh, contains stuff that we don't really know. You know, if you, if when you think about what a shadow is, you can see the, a shadow of a dog, and you know it's, you know that it's not a person, but and you may know that it's not a bird or a cat, but you won't be able to know what kind of dog it is. So inside of us when we have these 
parts of ourselves that we don't necessarily know real well, but if we pay attention, we get some, we can catch some glimpses sometimes of something's going on here, don't quite know what it is. So people have a, a lot of stuff that instead of dealing with it, it gets pushed back. Like, you know, just throw it in the, in the uh, do you ever have a closet where you just put all your junk? You know, you just, you got, you and one, and someday you have to go in there and confront the mess you've made. But, but for many days, it gets you through when you don't have time to fool with it. You just pitch it. Well, that's sort of like how the shadow is a little bit, that there's stuff there, there that's kind of been pushed down, not dealt with. But unfortunately, or fortunately, in order to be well, one has to acknowledge all of that stuff that's been thrown in the closet because it, it, otherwise it will take on its own life and then it will come and undermine you. So you'll be walking around in your community looking like you've got it together and then the shadow stuff will come bubbling up and take over and you'll find yourself saying stuff that surprised you or thinking things that you thought were not a part of the way you think. And I think that a whole lot of folks in our country right now have need to have a good confrontation with their shadow and and come to grips with some of the stuff that's there. A lot of the, the fear and negativity that is walking around on the planet is bubbling up out of those places, those community members that have been unacknowledged, that are unacknowledged and, and are, are kind of wreaking havoc around uh, because they've got power inside of us and they're not going to go away quietly and if we until the extent that we don't acknowledge them that just empowers them even more so the shadow is a funny a funny uh companion there's there's can also be empowering things that are hidden away in the shadow things that if we allow them to come to the surface we will be enlivened and enlightened and empowered and we'll be stronger people so naming all of our community members is a good thing. And, and how you do that is by paying attention. So when we watch ourselves uh, um, saying something that surprises us, instead of kind of pushing it away and trying to throw it in the closet, we interrogate it and we ask, where did that come from? We follow it. We follow it down the road to see where it takes us. And it often will take us to better understanding of ourselves. So sometimes I wonder why it is why it's so difficult for people to make changes, and how why is it so difficult to just be willing to see everybody as an equal child of God? You know what is it in the human psyche that makes us want to have to be superior, or makes us want to have to have a hierarchy? or makes us want to have to have somebody be less than so we can feel good enough. And I think a lot of it is this unconscious community that's feeling a bunch of deficits and we, that haven't been named and haven't been dealt with. And people are trying to figure out how to deal with that without really naming stuff and being honest and upfront. Jung said that if everybody would withdraw their own uh, the projections you make out of your out of this this uh, closet of where you've been throwing stuff, if if everybody would own their own closets and not go around trying to assign it to somebody else, you know, not to make other people into the enemy or to the monster or into the whatever. Some of you are old enough to remember that silly black guy named Flip Wilson. They used to always be talking about the devil made me do it. Everything that he didn't want to take responsibility for, the devil made him do it. And I, you know, and I get so aggravated with people who, you know, where the Lord told me or the devil did so and so. And I'm thinking, no, you just need to take responsibility for your behavior, either good or bad. You just own it. You claim it. You do it. Don't be trying to put, make, don't make God responsible and don't make evil responsible. Just take responsibility because you are responsible. 
you are responsible for what you do and think and how you act. So, and if, and if just because you're unconscious doesn't mean you're not responsible still. And there are people who are plenty unconscious, but their behavior is something that they still have to take responsibility for. So I think that, that it's important to be able to interrogate ourselves as Bell Hooks talks about. Look in the mirror and say, you know what, I did that. Now I don't exactly know why, and I surprised myself, but I actually did it. I actually made a fool out of myself or actually said that. I'm surprised at myself that I got that mad about this particular thing. Staying with that and trying to journal about it, ask other people. Uh, I'm gonna tell you one of the other best ways to deal with shadow stuff is to pay attention to the people who drive you crazy. Mm -hmm. Because most of the people who drive you crazy are really your teachers. You know, they, they help you to see some sides of yourself. If we can look at it, they help us to see some sides of ourselves that we maybe didn't see before. You know, why are they bothering us so much? Why is it that you can go through the day and there's one somebody that just, you can't let something happen and you can't let it go? What is that about? Why is that energy stuck there? Are the kinds of questions that need to be asked, you know? And I don't know why um, people get so uh, set in their bigotry and their uh, racism and all of that and seem to have so much trouble letting go of it. But I know that it serves them some kind of way. And, and it serves parts of their psyche that they don't, that they're not connected to. So I'm always trying to speak a word for let's try to wake up. Let's try to see what's in the closet. What did we throw away? What are we holding on to and why are we holding on to it? When stuff comes marching down the road, you know, what is that about? I mean, what is the, that sometimes some of the stuff that you hear uh, white people say about black and brown people you think, where in the world does that come from? And it comes from some deep place inside of them, some community member that they don't know very well. And, mm -hmm. and they may not be trying to know. I'm not saying that everybody's trying to be conscious. I'm just saying that when we start to really understand that people are not, that, that people are walking around with all these um, po possibilities of ways to behave these energy systems inside of themselves and they can make choices about what they do with all that if they if if they choose to but but they may not i mean they, you can choose to be unconscious too that's a choice you know that is also a choice to be conscious or not to be un, uh, to, uh, to be unconscious so and i do actually understand choosing to be unconscious because once you choose to be conscious you can't quit being conscious mm -hmm. You know, you know, it's like, don't you think some days you wish you didn't know what you knew because what you know is getting you into so much trouble and it's just gonna keep on getting you into trouble because you can't quit knowing it. And, and now you're just not the same person that you were before you knew it. So I get why people say, you know, I've made up my mind about this and I don't, don't confuse me with any more information because I don't wanna have to rethink myself. But this inner, this inner dialogue, this, this conversation that's going on inside of us has so much to do with what's happening external to us. Because there is this great big um, hard sounding concept called projection mm -hmm. that's not that hard at all. It's just looking at people and making up stories about them and making up stories about situations without having all the information we need. And if there was ever any time when we could can see that walking around, we just look at the ways in which uh, information is being brokered in the present moment. I mean, it's, it's scandalous actually. For, it's almost like whatever story you wanna tell, just tell it and, it and it's supposed to be true. Well, you can't handle the truth that way. You know, there's some, there's some boundaries and if you, if you cross over them, you're telling lies. It's not, 
anything uh, to, to be sugarcoated, and it doesn't really matter who's doing it. You're either telling the, the story with the best, if to your best of your ability, the way it was, or else you're not telling it. And, the, and you may not be doing it because you mean to, but you may be doing it because you're just so unconscious you can't tell the difference. I mean, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a very funny thing to think about. But what I do know is that what is inside of us is impacting how we are in the external world, how we act, how we think, how we look, how, what we say, and what, how we feel about who crosses our paths. Have you ever caught yourself driving your car and passing by somebody or they pass by you and you just have a little little story goes off in your head and you start thinking about that, them, who they are, what they are, what they do based on their car, uh, based, you know, just, a, just telling yourself a little story. And then you realize that's exactly what you're doing, but you're talking about yourself because you don't know a thing about that person that just passed by you, except that they're driving this car, that car It's usually some kind of fancy car, you know, uh, that I mean, I've done it. So if you, if, I may be the only weirdo on the screen, but I, but you may also understand what I'm talking about. So you think you, and then you get tickled at yourself because you realize you just made up a whole story about somebody that's based in fantasy. That you that you don't have a piece of fact. You don't have one single fact except that this person passed by you in a car, but you've got the whole little scenario. We do that kind of stuff so much because in the first place, our psyches are so happy to fill in the, the blanks when we don't have all the information. And it's one of the, it's one of the greatest pieces of how racism and, and all of those isms that separate us from other people gets to stay in place is that we will fill up the blanks. You know, we meet somebody and we don't have all the information we need, so then we just make up stuff. And what we make up is projection and it's coming out of some part of us that we probably aren't even all that conversant with. So how many times have you just made up a story to fill in the spaces? How many times have you decided, uh, made a decision about somebody based on something inside yourself that had nothing to do with them? You know, one of the things that I've heard a lot from doing dismantling racism workshops with search committees and vestries is how easy it is to project onto candidates that you're looking at on a piece of paper. You know, you look at their names and you decide something about them. You look at their age. I don't think you can put it. I think it's illegal for their age to be on, a, on an application. But you look at things that don't, that aren't enough information to be basing an opinion on and yet form an opinion that then determines whether that person gets invited for an interview or not. That's some serious projection that comes out of biases. And it's important to know that that's what we're doing. So in some ways, it, it would probably be a good idea if people couldn't even see the names of folks that they're trying to consider for jobs, you know? And you just have to look at all the stuff about them. And, and then uh, because we, the first projection is, oh, it's a woman. Well, I don't know how a woman would do in our parish right now. And I don't know how a black person would do or a Latinx person, you know, well, if you didn't have all that information, you might find them to be, your, your projections might be different. So it's, it's a very, it's very funny because in a way, the the shadow stuff is cunning and we don't know that's what's going on unless we're unless we wake up to it and so when i catch myself with a whole bunch of um thoughts about somebody else and i realize that those thoughts aren't embedded in any reality of facts they're just i'm feeling i'm reacting i am speaking out of my own space then i have to sit myself down and say now, is that really the way you want to handle this? Or do you want to try to get a little information here before you go flying down this road? Projections have caused people to lose their lives. The projections of negativity onto black and brown people cause them to lose their lives. So projection is a serious thing. Everybody does it. 
But what everybody doesn't do is pay attention to that they're doing it. And then they, and you can, you can catch yourself making the projections and make a decision to not do it. But you have to be awake in order to do that, to the fact that, that this stuff's coming out of your head and, and that it's not information coming into your head, that it's coming up from somewhere and out rather than coming from out there into you. I, I hope that, that this conversation is not um, uh, mind boggling here. I hope you've been thinking some about how complicated we are as human beings. But the fact that we act like we're just all kind of, you know, this is who we are and that's all it is to it. And then go down the road with do this, do that, do the other, instead of realizing how complicated and complex we really are and how much we play games with ourselves and how, tri how much trickery can go on in, in our psyches and how much the ego gets involved in trying to keep everything in balance. You know, the ego's job is to make you believe that the persona that you wear is really who you are. That is the ego's job, to verify that this way that I decided to be in the world, that's me. Well, it's only part of me. You know, I mean, I sit here with my, looking like I know something with my jewelry and all my glasses and, and I look like I'm, you know, Dr. Meeks. Well, Dr. Meeks is also that little girl that wants to do stuff, that, that's disruptive. I can be, I can have many other uh, iterations of myself in a day, just in a day, not, not a week, not a month, in a day. And it's important to know that all those people are a part of myself. And I'm not, you know, I'm not talking about being uh, mentally unstable here. I'm talking about just going through the day, encountering the layers of ourselves that we don't get encouraged to pay much attention to. So if we want to do dismantling racism work and racial healing work, it's important to know who we're taking to the task. Who's in the community? Who's being invited to the, t on, to the, onto the journey? You know, where, and, and where did I come from? You know, what are the stories that have made me be this person? What are the narratives? How have I stood in the world to, to make me be this person that's going out now to do this work? And do I know who that is? I think that I've talked to people who work with um, people who live without shelter. And I have said over and over to them that most of you need to just go home and figure out a few things because you're bringing a lot of projection here to folks that are already carrying enough burdens and they don't, the last thing they need is your projection. Mm -hmm. The last thing they need is your not dealing with the wounded parts of yourself and the, the exiled parts of yourself. So, you know, I knew full well when I went to work in the prison that I was going there so I could try to help my own self get liberated. I knew that I was going there for me. I wasn't going there for them. And I told them that. Of course, they thought I was a little weird, but it didn't really matter. The only thing that mattered was for me to be clear about what I was doing there and to, and, and to keep confessing that to myself. So I don't get onto my little, look how good I am, high horse. I'm showing up, up here to visit this guy on death row. I'm showing up, actually I was teaching, I'm showing up because I need to do some work around liberation and I can learn a lot about liberation and freedom by being with people who are not free physically, but have learned some ways to be free, even though they're not free physically. So they were my teachers, even though I showed up with the label teacher, but I understood what I was doing. And, I, and, I, and thank God, I mean, it was, a great, it was great for me. It was wonderful. It was exactly what I needed to do. But I named it and I, and I knew what I was doing. And I wasn't kidding myself about, I'm going there for them. Oh yeah, I was going there to teach because I did want to teach them. But a lot of the folks that are out doing good, you know, the do good work that we say go do, don't understand that they're working on trying to, to appease parts of themselves and they think they just have this 
great call to go and be whatever it is they're doing. I, and this is not to, to make anybody have a whole bunch of self-doubt. This is about just being awake. Because being awake means that you can actually be a vessel for God's healing to, to be manifested in the folks that you're engaging. But if you go all clogged up with your own sickness because you didn't allow your own community to let God's sunlight in, then you don't, you don't come as a gift. So a lot of what we do in the world has no, has no, no power whatsoever. People would be better off if we stayed home because we have gone with the wrong uh, energy and that energy only becomes a burden. And when it's poor folks, they don't know how to tell you that because they don't know really what happens, what's happening. And, they, and, and so they just end up with b bearing the burden of somebody trying to be a do-gooder when they needed to stay home and work on their shadow. You know, so I'm, I am such a proponent for let's wake up. And then when, after you wake up and know where, who you are and what you're taking somewhere, then you go and you, and you give it all away. You give away your heart because you know what heart you're giving away. You give away your, your, your um, you, you allow God's grace to flow through you freely and God's, uh, kingdom is made known in the world because we are free people that have that are going out empowered by God's great love and energy rather than folks who are going out uh, unconscious there is nothing worse than unconsciousness i don't think in terms of particularly when folks think they're conscious and empowered unconscious people are flat out dangerous because you've got power and you don't know what to do with it because you don't know who you really are and you're using you use your power in all kinds of crazy ways when you don't understand what you got and why and and it's not somehow um being mo modulated by uh the kind of inner connectedness you know howard thurman talks so much about the sound finding the sound of the genuine or uh, really being connected to your your what who you really are to to be really um conscious about yourself i mean he says it in in different kinds of language from what i'm saying but it, but his preoccupation was with that his preoccupation was with finding finding that part of himself because he said growing up in florida as a little black boy who had experienced um i don't remember now i haven't i, haven't, I didn't rewatch the film because I've only watched it about 50 times and so I almost have it all memorized but I'm, I'm, I'm not remembering if he tells the story about being stabbed jabbed uh, in the hand by mm. this child with a pen okay so he, he was working for these white people raking leaves for them when he was a little boy and the little girl kept scattering the leaves and he would tell her to stop and then she would do it again because it was fun for her. She didn't have to rake the leaves. She was just jumping in the pile and they go all over the place. He's trying to get his work finished so he can go home. And so he, he says to her, I'm going to tell your mother. And she just keeps ignoring him. And then he says to her, I'm going to tell your father. And it really got her attention because she, I guess she was a little more worried about what her father might do than her mother. So she took her pen out of her pinafore, you know, a dress that was had a big pin in it. She took that pin out and came over to him and jabbed his hand with it after he um after he told told her that. And he jerked his hand back and said, What's the matter with you? Have you lost your mind? And she said back to him, What's the matter with you? You can't feel. And Thurman said, in the light of that reality of living in an environment where the perception of him was of a person who had no feelings, who was nobody really. Mm -hmm. And he knew that he had to find what was the essence of himself, what was at his core, what made him human, and he had to hold on to it 
and protected against everything that was external to him. Well, the truth of the matter is, that's the journey for everybody. All of us have to find what is at our core and protect it from the stuff that's external to us. That does not mean that we're not flexible. That does not mean that we don't uh, feel other people's pain. It means that we don't let our core get away from us. We are connected at the root of ourself. And then all this stuff out here, we can deal with. And we can deal with the disparate parts of ourselves because we don't get so scared when we see somebody we didn't recognize come up on the screen and they live in our body. You know, I think that um, it's been interesting to me that every time I've talked about inner community in a sermon or something, how much people resonate with that. Because I think that there's something about um, the truth of how complicated we are and all the selves that are walking around and, uh, along with us every day that we don't get invited to acknowledge. We, we're always, you know, it's always like, well, you got to have it all together. Well, I got it together a little bit, but then I've got these contrary members over here that just want to keep on disrupting things. And so I need to figure out what's going on with them. And to just, to just name them and to be in, um, to be in conversation with them is a good thing. It's a very good thing. And if we're going to be out trying to help uh, reduce the projection of, of negativity in the world, then we need to make sure that we're not contributing to it. So I do want to tell you that a thunderstorm has come up. And I live in here in Georgia, where oftentimes the thunderstorms will knock off the electricity. So mm -hmm. if the electricity goes off, I will get myself back to you when, as, as, I, as soon as I can. But maybe we'll be fortunate and it won't happen. But sometimes the electricity goes off and we don't even know why it went off. And now here it's thundering. So just so you know, technology is wonderful, but it's got its limitations. And it doesn't seem to do well with the electrical stuff. So anyway. So I've been talking a long time now about the Rainmaker, about Thurman, about inner community. And, and, it's, not, and it, it's not to be a discouraging conversation. It is to be a conversation of inspiration and enlightenment. Because it means that if there's something that's um, hanging us up, that maybe we can get to the bottom of it. Maybe we can get to the bottom of it. Maybe we can find out why, you know, why is it that we have done so much work to make the world better and the world's in such a mess still? Mm -hmm. I think that that's a good question to ask. And for me to ask that question and say, how do I contribute to that? You know, wh how much energy do I, con do I put out in a day that contributes to the negative, to the, to the pool of negativity that exists in the world. It's an interesting way to think of life, to think of, the, the, to think of things in terms of energy systems. And to the extent that I let myself know about shadow stuff, that, that, that I open myself up to, in my dreams, in my um, encounters with people. I said earlier, pay attention to the people who run you crazy because they often are great messengers, particularly when you start looking at, why is this person making me this crazy? You know, somebody, I was really having a bad reaction towards somebody a few weeks ago, and I had to stop and ask myself, what in the world is going on here? Why are you giving somebody that kind of power in your life to be that disruptive? You know, and it, and it just harkens back to that little unruly girl who can't believe that Life is, it, is what it is. So every now and again, she's got to test out the waters and find out, are we really doing as well as you think we are? Are we, are we here in quicksand? You know, I told you a lot last week about my, my own journey and that little Arkansas girl that never thought she was going to get to be a grown-up woman, even though she meant to be. So, and, and, but she sometimes doesn't believe it. So then she wants to behave in an unruly manner. So then I have to bring her back to consciousness and say, you know, this is real. This is real. This is not quicksand. 
And that is how people, the people who filled with fear, to the extent that they need to go out and hurt somebody else because of their fear, if only they could have a conversation with that community member that's out of control inside of themselves and bring that person into some light, that energy into some light so that it would not demand that they go do something mean to somebody else so they can feel better. Because that's a lot of what's happening. That is so much of what's happening. Mm -hmm. So you go out into this world with this understanding of your own inner community and that you're encountering people that got the same issues going on. How, what do you do? How do you interact with them? How do you have anything to say? You know, and, and you, you know, you can't, go around talking about everybody, talking to everybody about this stuff, because they would think you just have lost your mind. So you, but you kind of just have to know it and you kind of live out of it and you're energized by your knowledge. And then and when you get a chance to talk about it, you can talk about it, but you know, you do have to be careful. Jesus talks about not throwing your pearls in front of swine. And I, I don't know what Jesus was talking about, because sometimes I just, I just love the way Jesus uses words. And, and I realize I, I, I really just don't know what this is about, but it, un, it helps me to understand, be careful what you say and be careful how you go about trying to explain things and how, how, because sometimes you're talking to folks and you're saying stuff that you just probably just kind of would be better off if you just kept it to yourself and just behaved in some way, you know, and if, and if you kind of can find out when you're supposed to talk, because folks will ask you questions. And if you pay attention, if you're living close to your own heart, you'll get some clues about when you're supposed to tell folks what your heart's about, I think. One of the other things that Thurman says that, and I do think he says that in this film, that the one place you can find refuge, the only place, that you can find refuge is in another person's heart. And it's important to, for your heart to be a swinging door so that your heart is always ready to let somebody in, always. And the more we can let go of, of um, not understanding all of these parts of ourselves and being kind of dragged around by the throat, the more we are willing to let go of that and let the light of God shine in, in us to bring us to greater understanding about ourselves, the, the more we are able to open our hearts to, to do this work. If you're gonna go to do racial healing work, then you need to have a heart that's capable of being open and, and, and being a swinging door. Mm -hmm. Because you're gonna encounter people that make you wanna send them off the planet, like I told you last week, and you, know, and you don't get to send them anywhere. You get to take them into your heart and you get to try to understand how come they're the way they are. You know, I, I have encountered some folks that, as a black woman, I would tell myself, have you lost your mind? You really gonna listen to this stuff? You gonna deal with this? And the answer is, yes, you are. And, and then I have watched God's miracles happen in terms of waking, awakening consciousness. And I've watched God's miracle happen in terms of my own realization that that person is not me, and number one, and number two, that that person has no power whatsoever over me, because that's the other thing that makes you afraid, that somebody's got power, they can do something to you. And so most of the folks that we think can do something to us have got no power over us, period. And, and yet we have given them that power. So if you give the power to them, you can take it back. And I, I wish to tell the, like the, you know, the militia people and the white supremacists, you've given your power away to fear that is so uh, unfounded and it's causing you to be completely not well and, and not to live your life to the fullest extent that God would like for you to live it and you could, you could let go of all of that and you could be a free person and you could be well because you don't have to live your life rooted and grounded in the fear of somebody just because they don't look like you or talk like you or think like you, you know? But if you can't let go of all that stuff, that think about what a burden that is to bear 
it is such an amazing burden. And that's part of the reason why so many folks are in the mess they're in, because it is a burden to have to carry all of that around and, and to be um, afraid of people and yet to act like a, that you're not afraid to, 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 mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, I, I think the bully, that those who bully people are at the core amazingly afraid and so so disconnected from their inner community and their core and they're just like the winds blowing them in every direction and and i do remember thurman saying in backs against the wall if you don't get this kind of grounding that you would then be blown by every wind that comes by and that's what we see right we see people that are just you know, they, and, and we see ourselves sometimes being blown around by too many different winds. And it's, and it's really important to, um, to sit down, to sit down and try to uh, recover. There was a, there's this lovely story of Carl Jung um, traveling with a, a entourage in West Africa. I think he was actually in Kenya. And he'd been traveling for two or three days and they'd been going at a fast clip. So this one particular day, they get up and ready to go. And, and all of the guides who were the native people just sat and didn't move. And Jung was all distressed and said, we've got to get going. And they just looked at him like he'd lost his mind. And he finally, they said, we're not going any place because we have been going at this pace like for these many days. And we're going to sit here until our souls catch up with us. So here we are. How do we need to allow our souls to catch up with us? And, and I think in some ways this, this pandemic has been an invitation to reflect on that. It's a sad way for us to get that invitation, but I think it, has, I think it is an invitation to reflect upon that. And, and catching up with your soul is also doing this inner community reflective work that I'm talking about. Checking in with all those folks and giving them um, a license to live. Because if you start trying to kill off parts of, your, parts of yourself, then you have to find somebody external to you that you need to kill off. And that doesn't work too well. So instead of having to kill off somebody out there, I come back to my inner community and say, yeah, I've got this little witch here and I need to do something with her. So let me not go looking for witches outside of myself. Let me just work on the witch inside of myself. And if I work with this witch, I won't need to be so worried about witches that I might find out there. So does this, does this make sense to you? And how does it resonate with you? And how do, you, how do you see it as being important to have this kind of uh, consciousness if you're gonna go out in the world trying to make a difference in terms of racial healing? So that'll give you a chance to talk back to me now since you've let me talk to you for nearly an hour. So 